Good morning. I'm Tom Burgess. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking to you as our Sunday school class. First, before we get started, I know there's a lot of people that are maybe hurting out there. And I know there are a lot of people that are having challenges in their life. So if everyone would just, to yourselves, quickly pray as I talk. Let's pray for the people like Mr. Martin and Mr. Morris in our class, as well as Bill Ayers as well as anybody that you know that may be struggling in this time that we're going through. We also I want to pray for Pastor Joy. It's, well, hopefully she can be back with us before long. Today our lesson has to do with two things. One, it has to do with who our neighbors are, and it also has to do with travel a little bit. Now that everybody's an awful scared of traveling, then it becomes a problem. Fewer people are flying, fewer people are even on the roads as uh, travelers as we go through the summer. More often than not, we have other things that we have to do. Recently, we've had sessions on, on spiritual hospitality also, and that was probably the theme of several of the uh, lessons that we've had in recent weeks. Uh, more specifically, Today's lesson is going to deal with a parable we all know well, and that has to do with the Good Samaritan. In the South, we've grown up under teachings and examples of Southern hospitality. Many of families, helping families, checking on our elderly neighbors, watching out for those in our neighborhood children, taking food to families that are experiencing pain or death, waving at people passing, even if you're out on the farm on a tractor. Stopping to help people when they have car trouble. And, and you could give many more examples as we go through those. The word hospitable, hospitable in Greek refers to someone who loves strangers. That ties very much into our biblical instructions. God commanded us back in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34, not to mistreat for farmers, but to treat them as if they were native-born and to treat them as we would and desire to be treated ourselves. I think that may be the first time the golden rule became knowledgeable. Scriptures are clear, both in Old Testament time and with Jesus, that hospitality is evidence of God, of God's love within us as individuals. It doesn't matter what color of skin, what nationality, whether male or female, whether rich or poor, whether Jew, Christian, Islamic, or atheist, everyone is God's creation and our neighbor. Have you ever heard the initials W? C S U. I don't think so. I made it up. These stand for three words that we'll talk about. The first word is W U D A. That stands for Southern Talk for Wood Up. The second part of C stands for C U D A. Could have. That's Southern also for good house. And the third word is spelled S-U-D-A, which is also Southern for should have, or should have. You won't find these in the Webster Dictionary, since they're kind of like our dialect, like Jeff Foxworthy, a complete book on our Southern dialect. Woulda is what we say when we would have done something and coulda, could have, should have, should have. We pray to God forgiveness in many cases, and our, our request to God is usually under these three headings. When an issue comes up within our own sphere of friends and our family, or even our acquaintances, that causes pain or hard feelings, we look back and we think in our conscience, we could have, would have, done things differently if we had the option of redoing. We often qualify ourselves with a lead out 
if we had only known, if we had stopped by, if we had spent some time with you, maybe something we could have done to help. These are unintentional, these are kind of omissions of acts that gets on our conscience. So the first thing we have is would have, what we would have done if we could go back in time, which we can. It's simply not something we did not do correctly. It's simply something we omitted. It's an era of omission that we sometimes live with. Also, when we look back at our prayers, our prayers to God for forgiveness, we sometimes have run into some hard feelings or emotional injury to someone without any intention on our part to do so. It may come to light in our conscience that we could have or could have done things differently. We could have approached subjects more positively, thought about other persons' welfare or well-being before we acted, or we could have been helpful rather than ignoring an opportunity to help someone. In short, by not doing anything intentionally wrong, we may have hurt other people by not thinking, and we would like to go back and change. But it's hard to put words back into our mouths once our tongue lets them slip out. This would probably all be under the heading of unintentional acts that we do. Finally, in the big that we normally go to God for forgiveness for, is the things that we intently or intentionally do wrong. In our judge and jury system, the one key word, what was the intent before you may be convicted of something. We can be convicted in our own consciousness, and that's what we can look back and our conscience bothers us. For example, we may realize that we should have held our tongue and not hurt someone emotionally. We may look back and say, I should, have, I should not have jumped to the wrong conclusions. I should not have acted aggressively or violently. I should have shown more patience. I should have been helpful rather than hurtful. And most importantly, I should have shown more care and mercy for someone before I hurt them intentionally. Keeping in mind that when we pray for forgiveness, these three kinds of sins, whether omission or commission, our hearts must be in sync with God when we pray. And Jesus often reminded us of that. Keeping these things further in mind, let's go to today's fam familiar scripture to see which of these conditions you might think applied in this parable. It may be one, it may be more than one. As we read the scripture, as we're talking about this good Samaritan, we want to, and how we should de deal with our <coughs> our neighbors. Let's first describe the conditions that exist or existed at what time that this parable was told. Visualize now in your own mind that these three people in the scripture, the journey, that the journey from Jerusalem to Jericho was about 17 miles. That's a long way if you're doing it by foot or donkey. At Jesus' time, the road was considered to have been very hazardous by foot. The road took a downhill turn all the way from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is 2,500 feet above sea level, whereas Jericho was only 825 feet above sea level. There was little policing, if any at all. Maybe a few Roman soldier, check, soldier checkpoints just to check people out. But mostly there was no protection. No highway patrol or troopers, no police force, no sheriffs, protective sheriffs. Everyone was pretty much on their own and no way to communicate. The only way that if you needed help would be a person passing by. As a result, thugs and thieves existed along the way. To travel along, obviously, would have been a very dangerous undertaking. As I read the scripture, also think along the lines of today. 
Instead of thinking of these three people as a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan that were on the road, instead think of them as a priest, a devout Christian, and an undocumented Latino that were on the road. Our teacher points out that a Samaritan is often referred to in the Greek language as a foreigner. When we think of a Samaritan, think of the term foreigner. I will never go, go ahead and read our scripture now that we have an understanding of the background and what probably or could have happened and how we can apply it today. Everything in the Bible is related to how we apply today to how we live. The scripture comes from Luke, the 10th chapter, 37th verse. And I will read. A legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Quote, teacher, unquote, he said, quote, what must I do to gain eternal life, unquote. Jesus said, what is written in the law? How do I interpret it? Or how do you interpret it? He responded, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your being, with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, and I quote, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live, meaning that you will have everlasting life. But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. So he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <clears throat> Jesus replied, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He encountered thieves who stripped him naked, beat him up, and left him dead, left him for dead. Now it just happened that a priest was also going down the same road. When he saw the injured man, he crossed over to the other side to avoid and went on his way. Likewise, a Levite came by the spot, the Levite being a very religious person of the Jewish and often of, of some of those were priests also, and crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. A Samaritan, or a foreigner if you would, who was on a journey came by where the man was. But when he saw him, he, moved with, he was moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, tending them with oil and wine. Then he placed the wounded man on his own donkey, took him to the, an inn, took care of him. The next day he took two full days of his own worth and wages and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. And when I return, I will pay you back for any more cost or additional cost. Jesus said, and what do you think? Which one of these three was a neighbor to the man who encountered thieves? Then the legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy towards him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Every day, we make decisions to help or hurt people. Whether we do it by omission, whether we don't intend to, or whether we intend to. I think Jesus' point is, is that our neighbors in all of these cases was other people that were created by God. All other people. That's hard to deal with, particularly in today's world. We are constantly, in today's world, bombarded by hateful talk negligence, violence, hunger, pain, fears, and all sorts of evil. Evil has, not, evil has not gone away since the beginning of time. I saw a quote last week about space where our country is, is, has 1,000 orbits or about 1,000 satellites in orbits. Most of these are critical communications for us. Other countries, over a dozen other countries, have unlimited, number, not unlimited, but un, I don't know the number of satellites. They also have orbited doing the same thing. In the article, there was this quote, quote, where man goes, violence is soon to fall, end quote. This quote was in response to Russia recently using one of its satellites to shoot a projectile into space perhaps as a test of their offensive capabilities with their satellites. 
Our country is now setting up the Space Command as a separate element of the Department of Defense because of the perception that we will have to defend our satellites at one some time, or even our country down the road from the possible weapons that are over our heads. My point is that we, as people on this earth, do not appear to be making much headway since the very beginning of time in our loving of Lord God with our heart and as loving our neighbors as ourselves. We do, however, seem to be doing a good job of loving ourselves, even at the expense of our own families in many cases. Abuse and violence is in every corner of the world, and also even sometimes it exists within our own families. It is our hope and our faith that when we leave this world to whatever God has for us, it will be a loving and peaceful environment, one without the evils we face today, whether it is from our own making or even things that have been created by God, such as virus-related diseases, pneumonia, and plague, cancers, body failures, and so many other challenges. That's part of our creation that we have to deal with. We often wonder why God created these. I often wondered as a child why there was a rattlesnake when the non-poisonous snake could live just fine. But we do not know how to not know what God's will is for us here on this earth. We have to deal with the hazards before we pass on to the next world. Perhaps Jesus used the Samaritan in his parable to represent God. And the road to Jericho is the world we live in, with some humans being caring and merciful, and others who really don't share these traits. Today as Christians, we know that God is available to us at all times if our faith is strong. However, we also know that God does not always do what we want. We can never know why God does what he does, nor understand when trials and suffering are sent our way. We may ask why. Job asked why, for example. He asked many times why, even though he was suffering insurmountable agony, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Even though he questioned God, he still maintains his faith through all the suffering that he experienced. And looking at our faith, we soon should realize that hope runs on parallel tracks with faith. We should realize, too, that God has granted us many gifts that other creatures he created does not have. Faith in God and the hereafter, <coughs> excuse me, has to be number one. Squirrels and dogs and cats cannot even conceive of the hereafter, or even conceive of God. We all know that God does not assure that we will never suffer. Throughout our time on earth, he promises to be with us, to help deal with whatever comes along. We are born to step forward into our hereafter at any time that the Lord wills it. In verses 28 of, Matthew, of chapter 10 of Matthew, Jesus states, quote, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body. Also, we must remember the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And I quote, Do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, and we are as we get older. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. We are getting wisdom more. For our slight momentary afflictions are preparing us for an eternal glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what we can see, but what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal." End quote. Going to John chapter 14, verses 19 through 20, Jesus tells us, and I quote, In a little while, and this one is very difficult to understand, in a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I am and you in me. 
and I in you. The world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know, you will live, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. That statement is very deep. We could probably spend most of our rest of our life trying to figure that out, or at least see all the truth that that complex statement says. To me, it says God is everywhere. We, he's within us. He's in this very room. He's virtually in everywhere in the universe, beyond what our limited minds can even conceive of. Jesus often spoke of Isaiah for. For example, in chapter 55 of Isaiah, verses 8 and 9, he states, quote, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your thoughts and ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, end quote. Isaiah, in short, is saying that although we are created in the image of God, we are not God. How we choose to treat our neighbor, or judge, or view the world around us, or even how we deal with our responsibility of serving God, we cannot always be sure of keeping ourselves in sync with how God would have us act. And sometimes, most often, that way. The only way we can reasonably align ourselves with God is through prayer, based on our knowledge of the Bible, and seek His guidance. We can even ask ourselves the question, based upon our knowledge of Jesus, what would Jesus have done in this situation? Many times in my work area, as I rode to work in the morning, my prayers would basically be, help me to do the things that Jesus would do if he was here beside me. The answer that comes to us is usually, or can be, shocking, particularly if anger is involved. We go back to what we would have, could have, or should have done. Back when our country was established, we were fortunate that it, established, it was established under God with liberty for all. In reading in a book recently by the Reverend Robert Jeffries titled Praying for America that a member of our class uh, gave me, a quote in the book caught my eye about faith in God. As you know, our founding fathers, such as Washington, Adams, Franklin, and Jefferson, and, and others, believed that God was central to the establishment of our nation. Judge A, he was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, had this to say about faith in God by nations, not people, but by nations. No, quote, no human society has ever been able to not maintain both order and freedom, both cohesiveness and liberty, without the moral precepts of the Christian religion. Key issues that we're dealing with today is something as simple as whether to wear a mask or not. Some people stand on the ground that abuses their right of freedom regardless of other people. At the same time, we have to have personal freedom and liberties, we also have to have order and cohesiveness in our society. Maybe we're just not practicing frequently enough what Christians should be doing. The most important rule that was re-emphasized by Jesus is to love the Lord with all your mind and heart and love your neighbor as yourself. This would be, of course, create a perfect world as relationships go. Not all problems, but as relationships go. This is repeated by Jesus from guidance in the Old Testament also in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34, which states, quote, When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as a citizen among you. You should live you should love the alien as yourself, end quote. I don't think anybody commonly reads that. Deuteronomy chapter 6, in verse 5, states, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That is the same quote going all the way back to Deuteronomy that Jesus used so many times. John Wesley described having us having entire sanctification as a, quote, heart filled with love for God and neighbor, end quote. As we all know, there are various types of love. And where there is love, there is emotion. There, where there is emotion, there can be intent views and feelings. If we truly have faith in God who created us and runs the entire universe, and perhaps even more infinite universes than we could ever understand. In fact, scientists nowadays question whether we could have unlimited other universes as large as our universe is. We sh and they could be side by side and we not even be able to know it. We should not be worried or fearful as those who do not know God. We are unable, all of us, to know how things will turn out ahead of us. We can't look around the cold of life. But we have faith and hope that things will get better and an even better life awaits us, particularly when we pass forward into what God has prepared for us. There's an old Japanese saying, get knocked down seven times, get up eight. That's what I always tell my children. When you get knocked down, get back up. Life is filled with challenges. Some created by God, some by our own doing, or by other people. When Paul was in prison and his future for his life was in doubt, he always spoke in positive terms of his release and his optimistic view of the future. His belief was strong that he would all would work out for him as long as God needed him on this earth. I think that's a good feeling that we should all have. I guess we should all preface our plans if the goal of God, if God wills. As I grew up as a youngster here and even carried out groceries for people at about 13 years old and listened to older people talk, nearly all of them, before they said what they planned to do, they said, if God wills, I plan to do this or I plan to do that. I find it troublesome now that we don't hear that as much as we did back then by the older generation. We tend to say I as a preface, other than if God wills. In our own lives, we experience valleys in our lives. Some people seem to have far more valleys than others. Even the shadows of the death can be cast upon others far more than some of us. And yet we have been rescued by God's will to have more and more time here on this earth. I personally do not believe in coincidences. Every rescue from possible death or injury I have ever experienced only tended to make my faith stronger. As Psalm 62 in chapter, um, excuse me, as chapter 62, verse 8 states, trust in him at all times. Without faith, there cannot be trust. We need to trust and open and up to God when we feel our faith weakening or feel that we are being isolated from God. And on occasion, I think most of us do, but particularly when things go really terrible for us. And hopefully this is a rare time for most people. Sometimes we need to stop and think deeply what is just the secular world around us and what, how is that impacted on the way we think? At the same time, our responsibilities in this secular world is very necessary for us to survive on this earth. And God intended it to be that way. We have to put a lot of effort just to survive. Yet there are many enjoyable and alluring opportunities for us in this world. We have stresses in our ability to survive Yet there are many enjoyments and blessings set our way. History shows how blessed we all are to have this high standard of living compared to what our forefathers and even people in the world have today. We only have to look at some of the photos, old photos of our grandfathers or great grandfathers to see really how poorly they have to deal with life. Enjoyment 
is another emotion that God has gifted us with, along with love. No other creature has these also. However, I think we as Christians would agree that enjoyment is not the purpose of life, but rather as a diversion or guilt to allow us some time of relaxation in dealing with the difficulties that we may, go, that we may be going through. In the military, soldiers are excused periodically from combat for R&R, &R, which means for rest and relaxation. I think we all need rest and relaxation, and that's the time to use any enjoyment that we have, of course, that doesn't harm other people, to have a break from the stresses of life. However, we do all agree, I think, that enjoyment is not the purpose of life. Another thing today, we literally know too much today. We know too much about what's happening to our neighbors all around the world. We cannot do anything about what's happening other than feel the sadness for them. We can pick up a phone in Thailand and talk to someone on families here on earth, which I've done in the past. We can look at TV and see things in live that's going on in Hong Kong or in the Mideast. We know too much about what's going on in the problems and seeing people being carried over the shoulder to a hospital that's been blown partially apart by explosions and other things. These are very sad times that because we can see things that people before us never saw before. From a practical stance, we can only help those that we don't know in their foreign lands by giving donations, maybe of money or of things, sometimes of our time. Our personal health is limited to those that we meet or, re or reach out to, whether it's during our travels or within our own communities or within our own families. The parable described by Jesus was based on travel, as they knew it in their boat in those days. We now travel farther, faster, and more often than anyone before us. Jesus taught this parable as he did for all others that would apply in that situation, but they also apply today. I think that was the purpose he had so many parables, that they would live on and on for future generation after generation. I hope I have been able this morning to convey to you that we are here because God placed us here. If God placed us here, he had a meaning and purpose for us here. We all have different purposes and abilities, and we have to do what we are capable of doing within our own abilities. As I close, simple prayer. May the Lord bless and keep you safe until we are able to meet together again. Amen.